this online lecture series on earthquake resistant design of structure. In the previous lecture, we have discussed some basic terminologies regarding earthquake engineering, that is epicenter, focus, focal depth, core shock, aftershock, magnitude and intensity. We ended the lecture by understanding the difference between magnitude and intensity. In this lecture that we are going to have today, we are going to discuss regarding the different types of seismic waves that are generated after the release of strain energy and also we will look at the couple of instruments that are related to the measurement of this ground shaking. So without any further delay, let us start today's session. Right, now the first question is how the ground shakes, right? So that we have already discussed in the previous lectures also that there is one particular point below the surface of the earth which is known as fault, right? So whenever the movement of the plate starts that is in the either horizontal direction or the vertical direction based on that particular movement the slip is initiated and based on the initiation of the slip the energy is going to release right once this energy is going to release this energy is maximum in the form of heat energy but out of this 90 percent of the energy is used for fracturing the rock and only the remaining part of the energy is getting converted into the seismic waves right so once this strain energy is released then it results into the generation of seismic waves which travel through the different layers of the earth and reach the surface of the earth, right? And that is what is shown in this particular figure over here, where you can see that the fault, that is the point where the initiation of the slip starts, that is known as our focus point, right? And the point that is vertically above that focus point, which is known as epicenter, right? So the focus is shown, the epicenter is shown, and from there also, the radiation of seismic waves is also shown in the circular direction. Why? Because these waves are going to be moving in a radi in a circular manner and that is why the term radiating is used, right? Now, the question that comes next is, what are these different types of seismic wave? Is there a single seismic wave or there is some categorization for this? Then the answer is that there are a couple of different, different types of seismic waves that we will study today, right? So, the primarily the seismic waves are classified into two categories where the first is known as the body waves and second is known as the surface waves. Now, as the name itself is saying, surface waves is basically the waves that are going to remain closer to the surface of the earth, right? And body waves is something which is going to travel from the focus point to the epicenter point and either it is either going to get reflected or getting reflected, right? Now, if you look at the further classification of these body waves and surface waves, then it is divided into two other different categories, where the first category in case of body waves, it is known as P waves and the S waves, and in case of surface wave, it is divided into low wave and railing waves that we will look into the detail in the upcoming slides, right? So, if I talk about the sequence of this generation of the seismic waves, which is indicated here by means of a figure that is shown here, right? So, if you look at it, then the first point is the focus point from where the initialization is going to start, right? So when you talk about the focus, then what happens is that that is the point from where the energy release is going to happen. From whence the energy is released, then the seismic waves are going to generate and these seismic waves are going to try and travel and reach the upper point which is known as the epicenter, right? But what is going to happen is that all these waves, that is 100% of the waves can not, not reach because of the characteristics that we are going to discuss in the remaining slides, right? So either two types of forms are going to be there. First form is the surface waves and second, was, second form is going to be the body waves. As can be seen in the figure over here, the surface waves are the waves that are going to remain close to the surface of the earth and the other type is the body waves, right? And as you can see, two different arrows are shown, whether one is, one is the arrow which is going in the upward direction, that is the waves are going to get reflected. And second is the arrow downward, that means these particular waves are getting reflected depending upon the geological strata that it is going to encounter along its travel path, right? So this is how the sequence is there, that the wave is, uh, energy is released from the focus point, then the creation of seismic waves takes place, then it is going to either get reflected and reflected, and then it is going to reach the surface of the earth. Right. So, coming to the classification of the seismic waves. So, as I said, the seismic waves are primarily classified into two categories, where the first category is the body waves and second category is the surface waves. Body waves are further classified into two parts, which is the primary waves and the secondary waves, which is also known as P waves and S waves. Right. And when we talk about the surface waves, then in case of surface waves, it is divided into two parts, which is known as low wave and the railing wave. 
right now we try to understand the motion of these waves what is the different the, what is the difference in the motion of these waves and what is the different characteristics of all these four types of waves so when we look at this figure that is shown over here then you can say that first movement is shown is regarding the p waves right so in case of p waves the motion of the particle is going to be in the same direction as that of the energy transmission right so as a result of that the only two types of movement is going to be there in case of p waves either it is going to compress or either it is going to expand right so either compression is going to take place or either the tension is going to take place right so and the second important characteristic of p waves is that the motion of the particle is in the same direction as that of the energy transfer right but when you talk about s waves then you can see that the figure or the motion that is shown of s wave is little bit different than what is shown of the p waves right so what is happening is that in case of s wave the motion is little bit zigzag in nature right why it is zigzag because it is going to have two components one is the vertical component and second is the horizontal component and second difference with respect to p waves is that in case of s waves the motion of the particle is in a direction perpendicular to that of the energy transfer right so due to that due to that reason and due to this motion that is it is going to have a vertical component as well as a horizontal component that is why s waves are going to be little bit different than what we understand for p waves then we come to the description for the surface waves wherein two types of waves are there their first wave is known as the low wave and the second wave is known as the relic wave so when i look at the figure then i can see that there is not much difference in the motion between the s waves and the low wave right it is also following a zigzag path just like the case of s waves where there is only one difference so what is the difference it is not going to have any vertical component s wave is going to s s wave is going to have vertical component and horizontal component both whereas in case of relic wave the vertical component is not whereas in case of low wave the relic uh, in case of low wave the vertical component is not going to be there right and lastly we come to the relic wave so in case of relic wave as you can see the motion in the vertical direction is going to be elliptical in nature right and in case of horizontal direction it is going to be same as that of the energy transmission right so as you can see all these four different types of waves are going to have different directions of motions and they are either going to have vertical component or horizontal component or elliptical component or both the components and that is why they are classified into different types now the question comes is which of these waves are going to be the fastest fastest that reach the surface of the earth and do these waves have any kind of limitation or not right then the answer to the question is that p waves are the fastest that will reach the surface of the earth as compared to the other waves so if we look at the sequence then we can say that p waves will be the first to reach the surface of the earth followed by s waves then followed by low waves and then followed by the relic waves and there is one limitation for s waves and that limitation is that it will not travel to the liquid strata right so as i said that once the energy is released from the focus then it is converted into the seismic waves these seismic waves will either get reflected or refracted right so this refracted term will come into picture in case of s wave when it will come into picture that is if the geological strata of the earth is such that there is a liquid strata in between the focus and the earth surface then as a result of that the s waves will get reflected from the liquid strata and they will not be able to travel to the top surface of the earth right so that is going to be a limitation for the s wave next we talk about the measuring instruments so if you remember in the last lecture we used the term seismograph that is the instrument that is used to record the shaking of the earthquake right so that principle and its uh, working mechanism is shown here by means of a figure that is the instrument that measures the earthquake shaking is known as a seismograph and it is basically consisting of three components these three components are namely first is the sensor second is the recorder and third is the timer now if i look at the if I, if i want to understand the working of this particular seismograph then it is very easily understandable from the figure that i have shown here right so if you look at the figure closely then there are several elements that are shown first is one support is shown from that support a string is suspended then at the bottom of the string and one mass is there and at the tip of the mass a pen is attached right then you also have a magnet which is close to the string then at the same time you can see a chart paper is there which is rolled with the drum and then there is a motor also that is placed adjacent to the drum so what happens is that whenever the ground shaking is going to take place 
the pen that is attached to the tip of the mask is going to record the movement on the chart paper which is wrapped around the drum and this particular drum is going to keep on rotating at a constant speed which is going to be attached to a motor right so what is going to happen is that the string mass and the magnet along with that the support these all these four elements are going to form the sensor the pen chart paper and the rotating drum these three elements are going to work as the recorder and the motor which is going to assist this drum to rotate at a constant speed, speed is going to work as a timer right so that is how these three components basic components that is sensor recorder and the timer are going to work together and it is going to help us record the shaking on the ground right now this is a very preliminary situation now you can also see a magnet in the figure the question comes is what is the role of this particular magnet then the answer is that this magnet is going to act as a damper right because if the control is not there then as a result of that what is going to happen is that the oscillations may be out of proportions and may we may not be able to record it so in order to control the movement of the string and the pendulum that is attached to it so as a result of that this magnet is attached which is going to dampen the movement of the pendulum and as a result of that the oscillations can be easily recorded on the chart paper right now there is another similar term or you can say a similar term which is can be used for the measurement of the earthquake which is known as accelerogram now as the name itself is suggesting accelerogram that means acceleration is one word that is coming to our mind right and as we already know that the motion of the ground can be either recorded in means of displacement velocity or acceleration right so if you talk about accelerogram the function of the accelerogram is such that the variation of the ground acceleration with time record at a point on the ground during the shaking of earth is known as accelerogram that is if you want to record the variation on the ground variation in the acceleration in terms of acceleration during the earthquake shaking along with respect to time then this particular graph will be known as accelerogram now as you can see in this particular figure the accelerograms can be of different nature right as you can see some peaks are very high some are very low some are almost negligible so why this happens this depends on certain parameters and which are those parameters the first parameter is the magnitude of the earthquake or the amount of energy that is released as the source we have discussed this in the last lecture when we discussed regarding magnitude right that it is a quantitative measure of the amount of energy that is released as the source so if higher amount of energy is released then in this case in the graph you will see that the peaks will be higher right if lower energy is released then the example that we have in here you can see where the peaks will be very shallow, very very shallow in nature so the first criteria will be amount of energy that is released at the source point second will be the what you can say the whether the so, for, whether any type of slip or fault is taken place that is what is going to happen the, regarding the geology also that is whether the strata is going to be a rocky strata whether a fracture is there whether fault is there that is also going to play an important role so the geology along the travel path from the fault to the surface of the earth is also going to play a major role as i told you i gave you example in case of s waves that in case of s waves if liquid strata is there then as a result of that these waves will not be able to move and they will be immediately reflected right so geology between the focus and the earth surface is also going to play a major role because what is going to happen is that out of the waves that are going to entire amount of waves that are going to reach the surface of the earth if certain amount of waves are reflected back then as a result of that what is going to happen is that the intensity is going to reduce and once intensity is reduced the ground shaking is going to reduce and ground shaking reduces then the acceleration experience is also going to be on the lesser side now what is the advantage of these accelerograms these accelerograms will give us couple of information regarding the strong ground shaking then frequency content energy content and the maximum amplitude that is likely to occur during the shaking of an ground right and lastly before we end today's lecture we discuss one more important term which we are going to hear very commonly that is peak ground acceleration right for example for example in case of calculation of earthquake forces this particular term is they are going to be there it is really given in is 1893 that is horizontal ground acceleration and vertical ground acceleration right so what is this actually peak ground acceleration or it is going to be what you can say the horizontal ground acceleration or vertical ground acceleration so as we all know the earthquake is going to be occurring in three directions that is x y and z all three possibilities are there right initially the estimate uh, initially 
we, the calculation given in IS 1893 was considering the earthquake in only two directions, that is the lateral direction X and Z. Now, in the revised edition, it is also considering the earthquake in vertical direction also. So, now it is a established fact that earthquake is likely to occur in all the three directions, that is X, Y and Z. However, the peak ground acceleration, that is the ground acceleration component is divided into two parts only. First is the horizontal component and second is the vertical component. So, what is this peak ground acceleration? This peak ground acceleration is nothing but the maximum acceleration that you are going to experience at a particular site during an earthquake event. That is how hard the earth, how, how hard the ground is going to shake. That particular quantum that if you want to measure, then it is known as the peak ground acceleration. And this peak can be obtained how when you will plot the graph of acceleration versus time, then the maximum, then the, then the maximum point of uh, maximum point that will be there on the graph, the highest amplitude that will be there on the graph, that particular point will be known as peak ground acceleration, right. And if you look at the waveform of horizontal ground acceleration and compare that with the vertical ground acceleration, then you will see that in most of the cases, the wave amplitude of horizontal ground acceleration is always going to be on higher side as compared to that of vertical ground acceleration. But it cannot be said that it is going to be true for all the types of earthquakes. In major earthquake or more in case of most of the earthquake, this scenario is going to be there. But the possibility is there that sometimes it can be a reverse situation also, right? So now we take the example that somebody now this value of peak ground acceleration is always in terms of indicated in terms of gravity. For example, 0.4 g, 0.5 g, 0.6 g. So what is this 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 0 0.6? So let us take the example of 0.6 g. That is the 0.6 times the acceleration due to gravity suggests that the movement of the ground can cause a maximum horizontal force on a rigid structure equivalent to 60 percent of its weight. For example, somebody is telling that this particular site is going to have a peak ground acceleration of 0.6. That means whatever ground shaking is going to take place as a result of that a horizontal force is going to generate, right. So now out of this horizontal force that is going to be generated, 60 percent equivalent to the weight of the structure, the horizontal force is going to be transferred in that particular structure that is standing on that particular side, right. Now we are considering the term rigid structure. So what is the characteristic of rigid structure? The characteristic of rigid structure is that all the elements or all the points, rather uh, it should be the points, right, all the points in the structure are going to move by the same amount. And as a result of that, we can say that all the points are going to experience the same ground acceleration, right. So whatever the value of peak ground acceleration is going to be given, that is going to largely affect the performance of building when subjected to earthquake load. And that is why this calculation has to be, and this term has to be particularly understood very well. Now, there have been events in the past where a horizontal acceleration of 1 g has also been experienced. For example, the 1994 Northeast earthquake in USA. In that case, that is entire 100 percent of the weight of the structure is converted into horizontal force and that is transferred to the rigid structure. That is the uh, meaning of 1 g, right. So, you can imagine if the structure is huge with huge plant dimensions and huge height, then huge amount of horizontal force is likely to be transferred to the structure, right. So, Along with this acceleration, frequencies are also going to be there and we will get an idea about the frequency also that is going to be there. So, this frequency is usually in the range of 0.03 to 30 hertz that is cycles per second, right. So, this is all about peak ground acceleration and I will end this, I will end today's session over here. If you have any doubts then please let me know in the comment section. Stay tuned for the remaining series. Mm -hmm.